I think it might be useful to give you a bit of an idea of, of how this thing came together. Basically, it's a joint venture between Lakehead University, the Alexander Mackenzie Trail Association, and the One Step Beyond Adventure Group, which is my organization. It's non-profit, and what it is designed to be is educational first and foremost. And what we're really trying to do is to, by reliving the journeys of a man like Mackenzie, to try to explain to modern Canadians just how important the spirit of adventure has been in our past. And I think we also need to realize that it was a team effort that first allowed this route to be pioneered, because it was the native people that showed Mackenzie the way, and it was the French-Canadian voyageurs who paddled the canoes, and it was Mackenzie, the entrepreneur, the visionary, who led the group, the immigrant from Scotland who came to this country. In the summer of 1789, Alexander Mackenzie was in search of a navigable water route leading to the Pacific Ocean, that is, the fabulous Northwest Passage. This adventure brought him and his companions to explore this big river flowing to the Arctic that would later bear his name, the Mackenzie River. People had been living here for thousands of years, still using bows, arrows, and stone axes. It was their first contact with the white man. Twenty-seven men and women from Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Ontario, are reliving Mackenzie's historic voyage. In the communities they visit, they reenact the time of the fur trade in songs, dances, and costumes. From their departure in Fort McMurray to the Beaufort Sea in the Arctic, they will travel 3,500 kilometers by canoe, discovering this large country. The expedition, led by Professor Jim Smithers, will last 10 weeks. We are on the Athabasca River, where Mackenzie and a few voyageurs arrived in the fall of 1787. Mackenzie was on his way to replace Peter Pond, then in charge of a trading post owned by the Northwest Company. Pond was a Yankee from Connecticut. He had been the first white trader to cross Portage La Loche and to paddle down the Clearwater and Athabasca rivers. In this region, he built the first trading post, long since vanished, destroyed by erosion. Freezing headwind has been blowing since early morning, making navigation very difficult. We find shelter under protection of trees and warm ourselves by the fire in the voyageur and Indian way, which Mackenzie describes in his journal. There's a good article in Mackenzie's diary, Roger, where he talks about uh, the Indians lying around the fire like dogs. Oh, yes. It's getting warm. <laughs> yeah. So. We're doing the same now, eh? We're doing the same, yes. During the winter after his arrival in Athabasca, Mackenzie learned a great deal from Pond. The old trader had been busy exploring the far north with the Indians. His map shows a huge lake and Pond tells Mackenzie that a large river flows out of the lake to the Pacific Ocean. In the spring, Pond left the region. In the fall of the same year, Mackenzie had another fort built on Lake Athabasca, Fort Chippewyan. Today it's called Old Fort. 
It is from this fort that Mackenzie set out on his voyage of exploration. We are paddling to the new Fort Chippewyan, located 50 kilometers to the west. Frank Ladoussin is a Métis and a trapper. My language is Cree. That's a language I talk, Cree. Born and raised with that language. And uh, my language is uh, en Cree. Je parle en Cree. Parle en Cree en anglais, en français, un petit rêve. Toute mon langue, hein? be quite a few people there on Old Fort years ago. A guy to go there that doesn't know the place, he would have a hard time to find it. Even me, as I said, I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't think I could find the foundations where they used to be, I don't know. It's been a long time. So Mackenzie and his voyagers would not recognize the place? Oh no. If he was to come back here? He wouldn't. He wouldn't. Would not. He would re maybe recognize Old Fort, just the hell, but... <laughs> Can he ever come back, mister? He's going to be lost. <laughs> In the spring of 1789, on June 3rd at 9 o'clock, Mackenzie began his voyage from Fort Chippewyan. In his big canoe were four French-Canadian voyageurs, Barriot, Delorme, Doucette, and Landry, two of the voyageurs brought along their native wives. Also in the canoe was a German, John Steinbrook. In one of the smaller canoes was Agena, a Chippewayan chief with his two wives. In the other were two of Agena's men. In a fourth canoe were Laurent Leroux and his men accompanying Mackenzie up to Great Slave Lake to build a trading post. Mackenzie's canoe was carrying a few bags of pemmican and corn for emergency rations. There was also a bundle of trading goods to secure friendly acceptance from the natives. Agena, also called English Chief, was to be interpreter. He and his two men were to provide food through hunting and fishing. The four women, besides paddling all day, would set up the tents, build the fire, cook the meals, pick wild fruit, and make clothing. Twelve hours of paddling drives you a little crazy. It's really, really dirty. It needs to be taken off and clean. Do you want to center or do you want to go groovy? I don't care. Yeah. Let me show our strappets. You went inside that. All right. Here, an important river coming from the west joins this water system. It is the Peace River, which Mackenzie will paddle up four years later in 1793. It will be his second attempt to reach the Pacific Ocean. Just here, at that point. Yeah, and the slave and comes the slave in. The photographer there. of the expedition, oh, Halley yeah. Flaghair, oh, has retraced yeah. this 3,000-kilometer odyssey oh, with the hope that someday yeah. this historic route will be protected and established as a national heritage. Yeah, see you up there. Are we leaving? We're leaving. Well, then. <laughs> Sit down, Monsieur Avant. My toilet paper. Uh, we're left heavy. Um, maybe the pack behind Andy. Could you draw there on the uh, left? What? 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 Oh, we'll come right around anyway. Are we? Once his nose. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> the Slave River Rapids. In Mackenzie's time, there were six portages totaling about four kilometers. Today, a road from Fort Fitzgerald to Fort Smith has replaced the portages. The canoes in our expedition are exact replicas of the voyageur canoes with one exception. The hull is strengthened with Kevlar, which is much stronger than birch bark. The native women, they would collect us. We didn't go out and collect it ourselves. The native women or native men would go out and collect it. Usually the women because the men were out hunting. 
and uh, they peeled off the bar, uh, peeled off the tree in the spring. So we don't know how to swim. I sure don't want to drown. Not yet, anyway. No, the company <laughs> likes it better. If we don't know how to swim, that means we'll care much more for uh, the packs and everything else, and be less chance of the canoe tipping. Because if the canoe tips, we know we die. So we make sure it doesn't tip. The last portage is still being called Portage of the Drowned, in the memory of five voyageurs who died here three years before Mackenzie's voyage. It happened right here. Nobody's ever been down there. It's pretty dirty water, very turbulent, but their guns are down there, their copper pots, all of the material they had to uh, travel down the river, in the bottom of that hole right now. Right there. On whether, uh, they retrieved any of the bodies or not, but this time of year it's fairly cold water. The bodies could have stayed down for a long time, and of course uh, they had a job to do: establish a post on Great Slave Lake. So they probably didn't wait around a long time to find the bodies. And uh, I don't think there's a record of whether they found them or how many they found or what. We are at the mouth of the Salt River. Here we can find an old cemetery where many generations of the Beaulieu family are buried. Their common ancestor is the French Canadian voyageur Francois Beaulieu. In 1793, he accompanied Alexander Mackenzie to the Pacific coast. Today, hundreds of Beaulieu's descendants are living in the Northwest Territories. Alice Sutherland, and Frank La Violette are looking for the grave of Beaulieu's son, also named Francois, who lived to be 100 years old, leaving a legend behind. Down here, see? There's quite a bit of sighting that you did before. Do you think there could be his grave? That's a grave, yeah. This is grave. I don't know his grave, but yeah. Beaulieu's grave, eh? one of Beaulieu's family. Oh, one of Beaulieu's family. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this is only Beaulieu's graveyard. Any other native people die, they, they bear them across the slave river. Oh. On top of a hill, there's a big graveyard for non non oh. Why? I don't know. It was like a family graveyard. Yeah. Bulu had a lot of respect. Well, I'm just going to go over here and reflect. Early this morning, we left Fort Smith, and now it is our midday break. Some people are trying to get some sleep, knowing it's going to be a long day on the water. Hey, oh, ah, brightness. To keep on schedule, we have no choice but to put in long days. This evening, after 15 hours in our canoes, we are still looking for a site to put up our tents. Jane and Leslie are very exhausted. Great Slave Lake, the fifth biggest lake in America, was covered with ice when Mackenzie reached it. They followed an ice-free channel heading toward a small island in the east. On this island, Mackenzie and one of the voyageurs gathered duck's eggs. Here we found that the waters near the island are very shallow, as pointed out in Mackenzie's diary. We're Jesus! Woo! We're walking on water! In the middle of a 500 foot lake. So this is Stony Island, Jim? Uh, this is Stony Island, right. He, they stopped here, right? Yeah, Mackenzie did. I'm going to get his book out so we can read the section from the book. Okay. Where he, uh, he talks about being on Stony Island in his journal. Like the piled wood on the shore of that little bay, the scenery has not changed since Mackenzie's time. The closure by sand was probably open, so Mackenzie probably came along the inside of that, and we came along the outside. 
and he mentions running a ground five times and we ran a ground uh, on the shallows between Stony Island and the mainland. So things are, are relatively the same. And then uh, Mackenzie was uh, wind bound or ice bound or storm bound in, in this area for quite some time, about six days. On June 14th, Mackenzie set off again. Over the following eight days, they did the best they could, going from island to island toward the north shore of the lake. Mackenzie's canoe was also rigged with a mast and a sail. Today, the winds are favorable and the weather is wonderful. We are gratefully allowed to relax for a while. It is nearly midnight. The wind is still blowing from the south and we want to take advantage of it. We got two hours here. Short and curly is my We will set off again the way Mackenzie did, going from island to island. mountain cranberries that grow very common here and the Indian women picked these um, as part of the food that they would make uh, dinners of on the trip. At the mouth of the Jean River there's a record of the Indian women that were with Mackenzie uh, picking these just before these and wild onions just before they left for the uh, Great Slave Lake. They're good? Mm-hmm. A little bitter but um, Similar in flavor to the swamp cranberries that you're used to having on Thanksgiving. There are a number of uh, interesting possible historic locations then in this particular spot. Mackenzie mentions uh, Caribou Island where uh, they caught some, some, some reindeer. He also mentions uh, uh, caching some pemmican on a small island in this immediate vicinity. And the basic problem was, as you see today, uh, the line of ice along the north shore of the lake uh, which prevented them from uh, pr progressing on their journey. On these granite rocks, there grow many varieties of lichen on which the caribou feed in the winter. Oh, wild onions! Mmm, try some. They're good, delicious wild onions. 
We can mix this with our soup, eh? Or if we catch some fish, we're gonna have it with fish. Mackenzie continued toward the north. We stop in Yellowknife, the capital of the Northwest Territories. John Blondin is a linguist and coordinator of the Denny Theater. In the olden days. And I will tell it in a story form as well as with this emotion, so that you can have an idea. Okay. The Denny. They're from the Northwest Territories. The western part. I'm Denny. And our clothes, they're made of caribou hide. Scraped in the sun and then burnt over a fire. The smoke makes it brown and it keeps us warm and clothes us. And we, the Dene, have lived all over the country and we traveled by our canoes. And our canoes, they are made of birch bark. In this Denny sport, the boys are on one side and the girls on the other. Winning is not important. The point of the game is the pleasure of contact with the opposite sex. Uh, it's called Nautsuye. And uh, the boys uh, push it, they don't keep it. Uh. Oh no. Yeah, the boys have to keep their hands open all the time so they hit the ball to one another like this and the girls, ladies, can keep their hands grasped, grasp and they throw it to each other. Okay. Because I'm really interested in it. I think you did an excellent job. Because we, we've trained a lot to do what we're doing. It's just it's nice to get it done the other way around. Yeah. To sit down and listen actually. Yeah. To hear somebody else's yeah. culture and story. It's really neat. Well, I'm, I'm glad to, to share this with all of you and knowing the riches of my culture and to share it with you. It's, for me, it's a, it's a gift as well to, to both of you, all of you. Great. Okay. Uh, everybody is to have two paddles, right? Mm -hmm. we've, got two paddles. Uh, we've got some extra bench shafts and I've got the one that uh, Nora made short for us. Did everybody put their own personal gear in the canoe and can guarantee that it's in the canoe? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. If you don't have your personal gear, if you're short, you're on dishes and cooking for a week. Today is the 22nd of June. In Yellowknife, they are celebrating the longest day of the year by staying up all night. We celebrate the day by leaving at midnight. Eleven hours of paddling after leaving Yellowknife, the group gets ashore so tired that they don't bother to set up tents. Somewhere on the north shore of the lake, Laurent Leroux stopped at an Indian encampment. He and his men stayed with them to establish a trading post. Here, Mackenzie and Leroux went their separate ways. They were given the traditional send-off. It was at this point 
that Peter Pond's explorations ended. Now, Mackenzie was to face the unknown. To direct him, he only had Pond's map and sketchy Indian information indicating that the outlet of the lake must be somewhere to the west. For a week, they followed the dangerous North Shore. Here, storms often force the travelers to stay on shore for days. Taking advantage of the nice weather, we go by night. Who cares about the clouds when we're together? Just sing a song and think about sunny weather. On the 29th of June, Mackenzie's anxiety was at last relieved. After 20 days of navigation on the lake, they found themselves at the outlet of Great Slave Lake. Here begins the Grand River, this mystic waterway spoken of by the Indians and depicted here on Pond's map. The Grand River is spanning a huge area and according to Pond is supposed to join Cook's River on the Pacific coast. Mackenzie thought he had reached Cook's River despite the fact that Indians had told him that the Grand River flows toward the Arctic Ocean. Mackenzie had Russian money with him for trading on the coast of Alaska. With a good breeze, they soon left Great Slave Lake and Mackenzie made camp somewhere near the present site of Fort Providence. Here, an arts festival is being held. It is an opportunity for the Métis to put on their ceinture fléchée worn by their ancestors, the French-Canadian voyageurs. On the shore of Trout River, we are camping with different teams of paddlers representing 11 communities of the Northwest Territories. They are on their first leg of a 1,600-kilometer race from Fort Providence to be ended in Inuvik. We will accompany them. We also meet Bill McLeod, a journalist for the BBC in Scotland. Well, I'm from the Isle of Lewis. This is where Mackenzie was born. And I remember as a child um, going to the church where his house stood and reading the plaque on the wall there, which says that he navigated this river. So it was a fascination with the man originally that took me here. And yet increasingly the man is giving way to uh, the people, and another is giving way to myself. Although I would hope it's not as narcissistic as that. Um, I just find him a very difficult man to get to know, but in some ways that's good. In some ways his disappointment is good, and my disappointment with him, with being able to find him, because I'm, not, I'm able in that way to find so much more. Best team. Best? Bill is traveling with the Atlantic team, and he will later join us in our search for Mackenzie.
This is the settlement of Jean-Marie River, where 64 people live. The natives and their chief, Ernest Hardesty, have had to work hard to feed all the visitors. I figure the way I figure now is that we're feeding about three, three times the population of Jimmy. Three times the population of your own village? Yes. <laughs> very nice of you, you know? Very yes. nice of you. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. In Fort Simpson, the drums are beating like they did for Mackenzie two centuries ago when the explorer met the people of this land for the first time further down the river. After leaving Great Slave Lake, Mackenzie's hope to reach the Pacific was high. The river generally flows westward, and the current is ideal for fast navigation. But on July 10th, what was a distant glimmer the day before was now in full sight, the Rocky Mountains. They block the river and make it turn north. It was a shock for Mackenzie. Now, Mackenzie was very anxious. Unless the mountains ended, or the river circled them, he would have to find a passage through them. In addition, the Indians had warned him of dangerous rapids and falls, which he thought seeing the first signs of here at Rocky Island. He needed to get more information from the local Indians about the mountains and the river. That night, their campfire illuminated the foot of this mountain. With two voyageurs and his Indians, Mackenzie ascended it. A thousand feet, a thousand feet above the river. It took Mackenzie an hour and a quarter to climb it. So that'll be about a thousand feet. From this vantage point, Mackenzie was hoping to see another river flowing west, but the surrounding mountains blocked the view. However, he had a good idea of the general direction of the Grand River. It seemed to flow northwest, and at this point, Mackenzie could still hope to reach the Pacific. Mackenzie was now pushing his companions, forcing them to put in longer days, in a hurry to meet with the Indians. Finally, just upstream where Fort Norman stands today, Mackenzie met with them. It took much tact for Regina to make them approach. <laughs> Agina conversed with them in the Slavi language, which is still spoken here in Fort Norman, and which, with the Chippewyan, dog ribs, hare skins, and lusher, make up the five languages of the Deni nation of the Northwest Territories. Here, Mackenzie learned from them that there were big falls further down the river, and that there was still a long way to go before reaching the ocean. The Indians had heard of what they called a big lake owned by white men, but they did not know of any river leading to it. They also knew nothing of a passage to the west through the mountains. Mackenzie was beginning to lose hope that he would ever find the route to the Pacific Ocean. 
While walking on the shore near Fort Norman, Mackenzie saw some smoke coming out of the ground. A very strong smell of sulfur. According to his journal, the fire had traveled from an Indian encampment to this coal mine, which is still burning two centuries later. Is it hot? Hot, oh, very. It's not burning soil. But all this is ash from the fire. From Fort Providence, John Amid of Canada Sea to Sea has joined the expedition. They lined the canoes up the shore here. An English chief was picking up some of this coal to use to uh, color his quills. So the black dye is what he was looking for. And the, the red rock here is probably baked clay that has been baked from the heat of the burning coal. And that's what's given it this, this hard red coloration. And inside of these, there's a lot of fossils. There's one here, for example. You see the leaves that have been fossilized on the clay as it's been baked. Beautiful. When Mackenzie and his companions left this first group of Indians, they forced one of them into a canoe and brought him along to serve as a guide. That night, he was closely watched to prevent his escaping. Oh, look at the pretty trees! The sand so rapid. They were not the falls that the Indians had mentioned to Mackenzie. They were rapids which Mackenzie's canoes negotiated easily. A few kilometers further downriver, they met with another group of Indians. The Tsintu River on the east shore of the Mackenzie. And it was here some 200 years ago, almost to the day, that Alexander Mackenzie saw four fires burning over in the Indian encampment over here. When he landed, there was only two old people in residence because all the others had run away in fear. And the old people could neither see nor hear what Mackenzie was saying, but they managed to approach them. And at that point, the old man started to tear out huge amounts of gray hair and give it to Mackenzie's party to try to beg for mercy. Sooner or later, Mackenzie managed to persuade him that there was nothing to fear. And at that point, they called to their relatives and 18 of these natives came out of the bush and were able to give Mackenzie local advice as to what he could expect as he went further north. <laughs> Alexander's men went through a lot of hardships. Hardships like this. Dump it on your head now, Phil. That'd be dramatic. For the Denny, the mouth of small rivers like the Tin Su is an ideal place to spend the summer. It is cooler and a dominant breeze helps chase the bugs away. There is also an abundance of edible roots, a variety of wild fruits, and the river is teeming with fish. Not bad. It's a Give northern pike. Give you northern pike? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a fighter. They usually a lot better than the other ones I caught so far. Oh, wait, 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 wait. She's not nearly as big as anything. No, that's just a little one. That's a little one. On the shores of this big river, however, terrible thunderstorms can arise very quickly. One of these storms hit Mackenzie's encampment that was then set up further down the river, and the ridge pole of his tent broke in the middle. Today, we are pulling through such a storm without damage. Oh, 
Our little tents are resisting owing to their flexibility. ramparts. Here, over a distance of 10 kilometers, the river gets narrower, flowing between two walls of limestone more than 80 meters high. Mackenzie approached them with apprehension, fearing to confront the dangerous rapids mentioned by the Indians of the Tinsu. But the current is not that strong. The river here is 100 meters deep, which keeps the current relatively slow. Further down, they came across another group of Indians from whom they obtained food again. Unfortunately, they knew nothing more about the river, nor of a passage to the west through the mountains. Then, on the 10th of July, Mackenzie reached the beginning of the delta. An astronomical observation showed him how far north he was. Then, he knew that ahead lay the Arctic Ocean and realized he had failed to find a passage to the Pacific. That night, tired and desperate, Mackenzie sat up to observe the midnight sun. Time is 11.55 and the sun is still up. Mackenzie continued to the ocean taking the middle channel. As for us, we are taking the east channel toward Inuvik. First prize to a Klavik, a wonderful performance by a Klavik, and here comes the captain for $25,000. Oh, yeah! Today in Inuvik, prizes are handed out to the three best teams in the race. Fred Beaulieu is a descendant of François Beaulieu. In the race, he was with the Hay River team. He is now with his daughter and granddaughter who live here in Inuvik. This sculpture represents the three races living in harmony in Inuvik. On top of the world, the Indians, the Eskimo, and the Whites, from which Beaulieu's daughter and granddaughter are descended. We are now approaching Gary Island, formerly known as Whale Island. Mackenzie ended his voyage here. It is the most difficult day we've had so far. Windy, cold and wet. Our expedition leader, Jim Smithers, is apprehensive because the map indicates shallow water off Whale Island. He decides to go to Kindle Island. There, he will seek information and advice from Eskimo who have set up camp for a two-week beluga hunt. Can we go in along the shore, or do we have to go outside of that sandbar? Right there. Yeah. So we we wanted to go down to Gary. Come on, all the way out. Check it out first. We could leave our canoes here, and we could just pay you to go down and come back, and then we can then we go back. But we're not getting any help from them. They find the sea too rough to take us to Whale Island. We have to be resigned. 
Over there, seven kilometers away, on the 14th of July, 1789, the young Scotsman is standing on the summit of that island with Aegina, looking out at the Arctic Ocean, discouraged. On the same day, in far-off Paris, the French Revolution was beginning. Before turning back upstream, Mackenzie spent two days on those islands in a vain search for Eskimo. We are staying a few hours with the Eskimo whale hunters. Phil, Brandon and Karen are given a try at an ancient game called Napacha, which is still being played among Eskimo families. The Eskimos' survival depended on their ability in throwing the harpoon. have only three days to come back to Inuvik, 180 kilometers upstream, where we will take the plane. To get there on time, this last day of adventure will have required 22 hours of effort on the part of our paddlers. For Mackenzie and his companions, there were 3,000 kilometers to navigate before winter set in. During their return voyage at this place where the river turns north, Mackenzie tried to climb this mountain with one of his Indian hunters. This bush is uh, mostly composed of birch and spruce, which is exactly what Mackenzie reported in his journal. He was eight hours on the trail, I guess. He, uh, when he left the river to when he came back, it was eight hours, and it must have, I would think it would have taken him four hours up and four hours down because he couldn't possibly have followed the same trail both ways. And he didn't reach the ridge, but he must have been desperate to see what was on the other side because the river of disappointment, he was on his way back upstream and he was trying to salvage something from the experience, or at least to be able to see that he could see the ocean or perhaps a big river flowing west on the other side of the ridge. But he must have been really disappointed at this point, I think, heading back upstream. It's hard to... Hard to put yourself in a, in a man's shoes who's committed so much energy to going down that river and all of a sudden now he's on his way back having been defeated and he still has a long journey, perhaps another two months going upstream against a strong current to get back and he was looking for that last little piece maybe that would at least he could tell people he'd seen the, the river, on the, uh, the ocean on the other side of the ridge. Two months later, on September 12, 1789, as the first snow was falling on the country, Mackenzie reached Fort Chippewyan. 